the Holy Spirit's ability to inspire. Let's bow our heads together as we get into the Word again this morning. Our loving Father in heaven, we only catch a glimpse of your magnificence and we're overwhelmed. We're humbled, Lord, even to be used by you as vessels to receive and to share you to others. What a privilege we have. And this morning as we continue to open up the good news and to expand it even further, We just pray for great clarity, Father, so that anyone sitting here this morning who has spent years of their lives trying to do the right things, only to end up with no peace and to still feel so short of your glory, give them great grace this morning, Father, as they come to the cross in Jesus' precious name. Amen. What a tragedy to spend years of your life And someone just walked up to me yesterday and said this, I've spent years of my life trying to do all the right things and I'm still not perfect. I said, well, praise God for that because if you were, you may not need the grace of God. Have you noticed something about God, how he keeps us all in check? That the more clearly we behold the righteousness of Jesus, the more clearly we see our own, our own imperfections. We see his beautiful perfection and at the same time as we compare ourselves, we see our own imperfections. And I want to tell you, that is of God because he is the altogether perfect one. And as we've been seeing, the plan of salvation embraces all that God has done for us through the atoning death of Jesus, followed by all that he then does in us by imparting his beautiful life to us. Having done so much for us, through the atoning death of Jesus, God then decides to address sin as a controlling power in our lives. He's lifted the burden of guilt from us, but we're still under the control of sin. So how does he handle that? It's unthinkable what he did. He decided to indwell us to bring his holiness into us. Having done so much for us, and someone said to me yesterday, please keep saying these things until we get it. I said, well, then I will. I'm equal to that challenge, believe me. You don't know how tough I am because you haven't met my mother yet, you know. (laughs) She's getting more vigorous with age. (laughs) having done so much for us through the atoning death of Jesus, lifting all that guilt and condemnation and death from us, freeing us up basically, not to sin as we found out, but to actually put on the living Christ every day, to be able to spend every day of our lives with Christ in us. What a privilege that is. Wow. This is how God breaks the stranglehold, the slavery of sin that we've all been under. He doesn't make us stronger every day with a shot in the arm so we get a little more holy every day and we look in the mirror and say, yes, praise God, I'm getting there, you know. What he does is he indwells us. He brings his magnificent holiness into us. I can hardly stand it sometimes. God is so holy and I'm so unholy by comparison that when his holiness comes into me at times, it's just, it's almost overwhelming. Do you know the feeling? Because you realize that somebody so pure, 
so far above anything you are, is actually deigning to come and live in you for another day of your life. It struck me one day as I'm driving around the the freeways of Los Angeles. I've got many children living around the Los Angeles area, so I'm constantly having to drive up there. They all think it's a huge distance to drive down to me, but I think it's nothing to drive to them (laughs) because I don't have little children either. (laughs) And it just struck me as I was driving, and my goodness, the holy God is living in me for another day of my life. And I stopped the car on the shoulder. It's a dangerous thing to do in LA. And I got out of the car, and I stood there and raised my hands in the air like this. And I moved into the most incredible praise. Because in LA, nobody thought that was anything unusual. You know, I just... <laughs> And I just stood there for a minute or two and lifted up my heart in praise to God that the holy God of heaven humbled himself to the point he not only took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh, but he's choosing to indwell me for another day of my life so that I need not be a slave to sin for another day of my life. Isn't that remarkable? This is the kind of grace that God is offering His children. And we've still got people that are all hung up on being perfect. They spend their lives trying to do all the right things and never reaching satisfaction. Let me share a verse with you this morning. It's one of my favorites in Hebrews chapter 10. I keep coming back to the cross. I can't get away from it. It's the key to everything. Hebrews chapter 10. I believe this is one of the more balanced and profound things that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. Hebrews 10 and verse 14. Look at the balance in this verse. By one offering, what is that a reference to? His atoning death, that's the offering. By one offering, he has... Did you actually allow yourself to hear that this morning? He has what? He has perfected. For how long? Are you actually hearing it? In God's sight, you are perfect for how long? Forever. Because you're trying harder every day, is that what it says? Because you've got a list of rules and you check them off faithfully? Is that how it reads? We are perfect forever by one offering. Let it sink in this morning. Of course, it's another way of saying you're justified. God is declaring you to be perfect forever. But look at the rest of the verse. If you've got a good translation, it will reflect the continuous tense in Greek. Does anyone have the continuous tense out there? It will show the word being will be used. Because of one sacrifice... He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And the NIV's done a good job here. They've picked up the continuous tense once more. We're doing a slightly more evangelistic voice than your (laughs) usual evangelistic (laughs) voice. (laughs) Because of one sacrifice, or as you said, offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Mm. And her version says, those who are being made holy. Other versions read, those who are being sanctified. It brings, that is the word sanctified there. But thank you for having the continuous tense in there because sanctification is a process, isn't it? This is an accomplished fact, but this is a process, a lifelong process. We are being sanctified. There are two Loaded words in this verse, aren't there? One of them is perfection. The other is 
sanctified, and the good news is they are not identical. One of them you have through the death of Jesus for how long? Forever. The other is a process going on in your life leading you to maturity. But I challenge you this morning, you will never reach a point where you'll rise up and say, thank you God, I'm perfect. As long as you've got your eyes on the perfect one, that will never happen. I'm convinced, by the way, we're going to spend eternity growing still into his likeness. How's your faith? Isn't this morning, isn't that a beautiful verse? Perfection and sanctification are not the same thing. God knows that. That's why he grants us perfection as we are undergoing sanctification. We have complete perfection. We are justified every day of our lives. It's the most under appreciated gift that God has given the human race. I have so few friends still that are coming to the cross every day looking at the broken body of Jesus and saying, thank you God for allowing Jesus to become sin for me. For declaring me to be righteous. I don't feel righteous, but God says in his sight, I am righteous. I'm claiming again this morning, Romans 6, 11, consider yourself to be, well, some of you haven't even got that yet, <laughs> Romans 6, 11, consider yourself to be dead to sin. Consider it, says Paul. Don't wait to feel it. It's got nothing to do with your feelings. It's an act of faith because Jesus has been accepted by God in your stead. The resolution of the sin problem has been placed on Jesus, not on you and me. Another feeble response. How can I live with this? Huh? The resolution of the sin problem has been placed on Jesus and not on you and me. Is that good news or what? It's the very best news we could ever have because it frees us up to move into a daily walk with Jesus, to have him in us every day so that his holiness can bring about maturity and sanctification within us. I wonder if I've still got that little statement. Yes, I've still got it here. Powerful little statement that I occasionally bring in from my favourite Christian author. This is a very beautiful statement from the Review and Herald, July 7, 1904. In an article titled Genuine Conversion, this is the clearest statement uh, of understanding the new birth. It sheds light on the biblical term, the new birth which is another way of saying having the mind of Jesus in you every single day. This is the clearest statement about the mind of Jesus in us or the new birth I have ever read in my entire life. And every time now when I read those words in the scripture, I allow this thought to jump into my mind. The leaven of truth, that's her way of describing the Holy Spirit. The leaven of truth works secretly silently, steadily, to transform the soul. Do you like that alliteration there? Secretly, silently, steadily. I love uh, the English here, it's beautiful. The natural inclinations are softened and subdued. And now's the interesting part, new. Let's see, we're running out of space here, aren't we? New. We're still back here, remember? We're in here. Christ in us now. I'm moving fully into this second section. And she uses the term new. This is where it gets very exciting. New thoughts. New feelings. New 
motives are implanted. Whose do you think they are? A new standard of character is set up, the life of Christ himself. Let it hit you this morning, please. Let it hit you. You've come to the cross. You've taken hold of the atoning death of Jesus. You've allowed God to declare you righteous again. You've realized in the atoning death of Jesus, your death has taken place. Your guilt fell on him. Your condemnation fell on him. Your judgment fell on him. And you're so grateful, you lift up your heart and you say, thank you, Father. Do you know what God's response is? He immediately puts his spirit upon you. And the Holy Spirit only has one focus in ministry. By the way, the afternoon meetings are going to develop this. The afternoon series is not the same as the morning series. We're going to deal with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That'll be at four o'clock in the afternoon and you will be much more participative in the afternoon. So those of you that have the gift of martyrdom should be here at four o'clock in the afternoon. (laughs) I don't have a lot of time for participation in these morning meetings. But the moment you take hold of that atoning death anew, God's glorious gift to you, his response is to bring the Spirit into you and the Spirit's work is to bring the living Christ into us. And in actual fact, you receive the thoughts of Jesus. You receive the feelings. Is that good news? You receive the feelings of Jesus. You receive the motives of Jesus. Every day of your life, the living Christ through the Spirit is coming into the minds of those who come to the cross and take hold of his amazing death. God's gift then is to bring the beautiful life of Christ into you. You'll start thinking totally different thoughts. I doubted for two years once I started practicing this and God rebuked me so strongly. He said to me one morning, didn't you pray for my mind this morning? So whose thoughts do you think you're having? I said, wow, forgive me. Why am I doubting? These are the thoughts of Jesus and I am empowered to act upon them. I can have the feelings of Jesus every single day. I used to seriously doubt the will of God. How do I really know what God's will is? Now I know by putting on the mind of Jesus Every single day. I know exactly his will and purpose in my life. Whereas I used to doubt before, nine times out of ten now, it's crystal clear. And if it's not clear, God's advice to me is don't act. Continue to seek my mind until it's crystal clear and then act upon it. I know my older son, who's a pastor in Southern California, he had a call recently to move to, to Maryland to pastor the, the New Hope Church over there. It's a big contemporary church with about 800 members. And he was like a seesaw. He would call me up every other day, I don't know what to do, I think I'm going to go. The next day he would call me and say, no, I think I'm not going to go. So one day I called him up and I said, I want to tell you something, vacillation is not of God. If this is a call from God, you'll be crystal clear in your thinking. You will know beyond any shadow of doubt this is God's call to you. But this seesawing business suggests to me this is not of God. So he called me up two days later and he says, I'm not going. I said, praise the Lord. I said, I would have supported you if you'd called me up and said, this is God's call and I'm going, but you are like a seesaw back and forth. You will not be a seesaw if you put on the mind of Jesus every single day. You will know the will of God. You'll have no accidental encounters in your life, by the way, because Jesus in you will be constantly seeking for souls. 
I was in Atlanta about 12 months ago. I needed a new shirt. So I went to the, the mall in Buckhead, my favorite part of Atlanta. And there were two big stores there. Bloomingdale's was here and Macy's was there. And in my mind, I felt a strong compulsion to go into Macy's. I'm not a big shopper, so it didn't make any difference to me. So I went into Macy's and I finally, I get lost in these stores, I finally found the menswear section. And I walked up to the counter and there's a young woman behind the counter and she's weeping her eyes out. And I said, it's just my destiny. <laughs> I come in to buy a shirt and, the, and the, the shopkeeper's weeping. So I said to her, can I help? She said, no, it's just too terrible. I said, well, I said, I have been known to help people who are in pain before. Do you want to share it with me? No, it's awful. It's terrible. It just happened to me this morning. I said, please share it with me. I believe I might be able to help you. I said, what terrible thing has happened to you? I'm trying to imagine what terrible thing. Must, this is a young woman, couldn't be more than 21 years of age. Oh, she said, it happened this morning when I came to work. I'm preparing myself for some terrible revelation. She said, the manager called me in this morning and he said to me, we're moving you from cosmetics to menswear. <laughs> oh, I said, how disastrous. I mean, that is disastrous. Fancy being moved from cosmetics to menswear. I'm trying to keep a straight face. This is a big disaster, you know. I said, well, look on the bright side. But she said, is there a bright side? I said, absolutely. If you hadn't moved to menswear, you would not be meeting me. <laughs> I said, trust me, you would not have met me in cosmetics. <laughs> well, she said, why is that so important? I said, it's important because I have the solution to your problem, I can offer you something that will guarantee you peace of mind. Amen. Even if your circumstances are horrible, you can keep your peace of mind. And I'd like to share it with you if you'll stop weeping for one minute. I want to tell you some very good news. And I shared the good news with her. She dried her eyes. She said, well, I thought I was a Christian. I said, well, I'm encouraging you now to be a stronger Christian. This is what God is offering you in Jesus Christ. And I would like to pray with you right now in the middle of Macy's. Let's get all this on videotape, you know? She said, you see those two young men over there? They need prayer as much as me. Can I pull them in too? I said, of course, let's have a prayer meeting right here in Macy's, you know? <laughs> so they came over and joined us. There's now four of us. She said, oh, and I've also got a physical problem. I'm losing my hearing in one ear. I said, I lay hands on people for things like that. So as I pray for you, I'll have my hand on your ear. We had the most powerful time of prayer and uplift together. So just recently, I was back in Atlanta again, and I walked into Macy's, and they all came running up to me. Can we have another meeting? I said, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they said, we've got eight people now. I said, Fantastic. And I looked up and I laughed to myself, I'm taking over Macy's now for Jesus, you know. <laughs> you know what I said to myself? I never used to have these encounters. I never used to have these experiences until I understood the meaning of putting on the mind of Jesus because Jesus is hungry for ministry. You know that, don't you? He doesn't miss these opportunities How's your faith this morning? You want to become more like Christ? Yeah. Then put on the mind of Jesus every single day. You'll have his thoughts. You'll have his feelings. You'll have his convictions in you. And all of a sudden, the ordinary things in your life will become extraordinary. Because Jesus has such a hunger for souls. He feels every hurt of every human being. You hearing this message this morning? 
We're talking about Christ in you. This is not what he's done for you now. This is what he can do in and through you every single day. If you've never experienced compassion in your life, you're going to be overwhelmed as God's compassion grips you. I said to God, I'd like to taste it every day of my life. It's the sweetest experience to see how compassionate God is toward other human beings. So any questions opening up on part two here? I'm going to spend a few minutes this morning in case anyone has a question on Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let's have the microphone. Uh, thanks very much. Over here. One, one minute, please. Uh, we need to capture this on tape. The whole world wants to hear you. I'm sorry. I just wanted the quotation again, the source of that the quote. The quotation again, okay. Sorry. Review and Herald, July 7, 1904. An article called Genuine Conversion, a very beautiful article. And this is a very profound little statement, isn't it? That I can actually have the thoughts of Jesus. This is what Paul meant when he said, put on the mind of Christ. I'm starting to think Jesus' thoughts and to feel his very feelings. Wow. Imagine what would happen in churches if people started experiencing this. Why, we may end up with churches where they love one another. Hallelujah. Yeah. Regarding thoughts that we all have, sometimes I wonder and I ask God, some thoughts come into my mind. Are these your thoughts, God's, or are these my thoughts? Well, the only way to handle that is to positively, by faith, every day come to the cross and take hold of the atoning death of Jesus believing that God's response to you is to bring the mind of Christ into you. Then you won't have any doubt. I went through that doubting period for two years myself until God rebuked me so strongly for doubting. You know? That's the only way to handle it. You can't operate that way. You have to go back to the beginning and come to the cross. Then you'll have every confidence that I'm spending another day of my life with Christ in me. So the thoughts I'm having are not mine. They're coming from him and I'm privileged to act upon them. Not necessarily a question, but what I've learned, the way to put this into practice, and I would tell people, we run around in our motorhome all winter, so I, mm. this, is, this is the thing that I, I challenge people to do. Don't do it unless your shoes are tied on real tight. It's, my morning prayer is, Lord, bring people into my life today that I can share your love with in some way with no strings attached. And then after I got a few of these things, I had to add and give me the courage to do what you ask. Mm -hmm. And it might be a little homeless lady, mm -hmm. or it might be easy. Some of them are extremely hard. Some of them are extremely painful. But who am I to say no to God? Mm -hmm because of all the wonderful things that he's done Amen. in my life. But it's, it's not for the ones of faint of heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. The only dimension I'm adding to this is the awareness that it's Christ in you who's actually seeking those souls. But this is a powerful testimony. Thank you. Brother down the front here. One of the things that I constantly repeat in my mind is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. yes. And that comes out of Colossians, and in Colossians 1.27, it says, uh, to whom God would make known that his riches of glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, mm. whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ mm, 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 Jesus, mm, mm, mm. whereunto I also labor, striving according to his workings, yes. which worketh in me mightily. Mm, mm, mm. So what we're talking about this morning is how we actually become like Christ. Thank you for that. Wow. Any other hands up this morning? Another verse that we could use is... Uh, Psalms 19, verse 14. Let this mind be... Not... Sorry. <laughs> Let the meditation in my heart 
be acceptable unto you, mm. my strength and my redeemer. Beautiful verse, huh? Yes, thank you for that. Very powerful. Last opportunity. Anybody else chipping in this morning? Please. I'd encourage others who might be interested in doing this. I, I don't promote myself as being much of anything, but uh, but I have taken on myself to, to grab people by the hand when they're clearly hurting and they need help to, to pray with them. Amen. And, Amen. Uh, interestingly, I have patients who come in and they won't leave until I pray with them. And my wife was up skiing and she's on the ski lift and she's talking to these two gals and it turns out they work at the hospital where I work and they didn't, I didn't know them from Adam. I had no idea that they even knew who I was. Mm, but mm, uh, anyway, mm. as they're talking, then they recognize that she's my wife and, you know, that, that we're mm, connected. Mm. They say, oh, yeah, he's a doctor who prays with patients. Ah, and, praise um, the Lord, huh? Mm. It's, it's a very nice thing to do. And, and you'll find that the, the experiences you have are, are very helpful. Amen. Helpful for, not, for other people, but helpful for yourself. And it's not that hard to do. Beautiful, And people, beautiful. when they're hurting, they... they they rarely turn me down. I've had in 25 years maybe less than half a dozen people who said no. Almost invariably they'll say yes, and they will want you to pray with them. And it's, it's a very experience. powerful testimony, and I appreciate it very much. That's why in the beginning it was called medical missionary work, because yeah. it was intended to be ministry just like that. Praise the Lord. Huh? Hmm. Very powerful. Do we miss anybody? Any other hands up? Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, what an amazing God you are. You're sitting up there administrating the entire universe and yet you have time to look down to my hometown and spot one middle-aged homeless woman in great pain and you want to reach out your loving arms and express your compassion to her through a human instrument. I'm humbled, Father, that you allowed me the privilege of experiencing your compassion and your love for this woman. And I'm overjoyed at the knowledge that Jesus can complete his ministry through us. Give us all the gift of faith today so that as we come to the cross and express our gratitude anew for all that you've done for us, we will begin to seriously appreciate what you can now do in and through us every single day, so that you will ultimately be glorified on this earth in your people who are truly like you. Thank you in anticipation in Jesus' precious name. Amen.